Um, here's another example, sexual variations. You know, men get fat above the waist, hence the beer belly. Women tend to get fat below the waist. So both these cases, they would have taken in more calories than they expended. But the fat goes to entirely different places. Um, you can think of this when you think about puberty. Um, boys and girls start puberty with roughly about the same amount of body fat. And then as they go through puberty, the boys lose fat and gain muscle, and the girls gain fat and breasts and hips. Um, they both take in more calories than they expend because they're both getting bigger. So this, act, this fact of overeating, of positive calorie balance, is irrelevant because one gains muscle and one gains fat. So what does the overeating have to do with it? And then uh, Eric Graff, a German metabolism specialist, said, you know, the, the energy concept cannot be applied to this realm. It's irrelevant. You know, it's all about hormones. Hormones drive them to grow. Sex hormones determine whether they lose fat and gain muscle or gain fat. Um, here's a particularly uh, odd example. This is the, the lipodystrophies means, lip, lipo means fat. And dystrophe means, I don't know what dystrophe means. It means weird fat accumulation. That's what I'm <laughs> it's a Saturday. I get, you know, I get a few memory lapses. Um, this is called progressive lipodystrophy. Okay? By the 1950s, there were about 200 cases of this on record, mostly in women. And in these cases, they, they start losing all subcutaneous fat in their head, and it moves downward. It progresses downward. That's why it's called progressive lipodystrophy. One British physician calculated it in his patient. It went down about one inch a year. And then they get down to the waist. So now they completely zero body, effectively zero body fat above the waist, and then below the waist they get often get this lower body obesity. So this woman was five foot four. She weighed I forget if it was 185 or 205 pounds. She had a body mass index greater than 30, which means technically she was obese, but all the fat was below the waist. And the way these Europeans said, they said, look, are we going to blame the top half on undereating, and the bottom half on overeating? And that's obviously absurd, right? But if that obesity was just slightly, you know, if she had about 10 pounds more fat on the upper body, um, she would look, she'd go into the doctor, and the doctor would just say, hey, you're obese, you know, exercise more and, and stop eating so much, and that would be the end of it. But we can see from this localized obesity, in conjunction, we can think of this as the, the malnutrition and obesity coexisting in the same population, in the same person that the idea that this fat distribution is caused by overeating is a little bit absurd. Okay, so why do we believe calories in, calories out? The reason we believe it is the first law of thermodynamics, which is energy conservation. Thermodynamics gets really complicated, but this one's easy. It means you can't make energy appear or disappear. That's all it says. So energy is always conserved, no matter what happens. Like if we get blown, well, the, my car gets blown up out in the parking lot, all the pieces are going to go places and the energy, and you could actually, if you had a you know, good enough piece of equipment, you could follow all the energy and you could find out where it all went and none of it just vanished. It all goes somewhere into heat or friction or you know, uh, energy to blow the car. Anyway, that's all we're saying. Law of thermodynamics, first law says energy is neither created nor destroyed. And what this means also is This is delta E, change of energy in a system. If a system gets bigger, the mass of a system goes up. It's e in means the energy going into the system, E out the energy going out. So if, if a system gets bigger, if the mass increases, it has to take in more energy than it expends. Because you can't just create energy out of nothing. And as the mass gets bigger, it has more energy. If a system gets smaller, if the mass goes down, it has to expend more energy than it takes in. Okay. So what we say, the reason we believe this, so we have this change in the mass, where delta E is going to be our fat mass, so change in the fat mass equal to energy consumed minus energy expended. Okay? If we consume more energy than we expend, then this number is positive, so our fat mass has to get bigger. And if we expend more energy than we consume, so this is like 2,500 calories a day and this is only 2,200, our fat mass has to get smaller. That's what this equation says, OK? It's always true. The laws of thermodynamics are always true. They tell us something about the universe. The problem is there's no causality in the laws of thermodynamics, OK? What that means is it says 
literally, if a system gets more massive, it has to take in more energy than it expends. It says nothing about why that happens. There's zero information in it about cause. So to give you an example of what I mean, I'm going to give you an exact analogy. Let's say somebody wants to know why this room got crowded, OK? Because when you talk about why someone got fatty, you want to know why they have so much energy in their fat tissue. And if you want to know why this room is crowded, there's energy in all of us people. Why is there so much energy in this room? So you ask me, Gary, why did the room get crowded? And I say, because more people came in than left. OK? That had to happen, right? I've told you absolutely nothing meaningful, because you knew more people came in than left, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be crowded. I'm saying the exact same thing here when I say somebody gets fat because they take in more energy than they expend. And then you say to me, OK, really, Gary, obviously more people came in than left, but why did it get crowded? And I say, well, if more people come in than leave, it has to get crowded, right? That's also true. It has to be true. And I still haven't told you anything meaningful. And I'm still saying the same thing is if we take in more energy than we expend, we have to get fatter. It has to be true. It's always true, but it tells us nothing about why the person got fat or not. Nothing. OK, and this is the biggest mistake in obesity research. And I mean, it's almost unbelievable to me, now that I understand it, that people actually believe that the laws of thermodynamics say anything about why we get fat. If you got fat, if you're fat, you took in more energy than you expended. OK, that's a given. But we have, this law says nothing about why that happened. And that's the fundamental problem. Moreover. If somebody tells you you could lose weight by taking in less energy, so let's say you're going to eat less. Shemini is a better example, the exercise example. I'm going to say if you just increase your exercise, if you expend more energy and keep your intake the same, you're going to lose weight. And that's true. But the question is, is it possible to expend more energy? and keep your intake the same. Because when I say all you have to do is expend, increase your expenditure and keep your intake the same, I'm assuming that the energy you take in and the energy you expend are what mathematicians would call independent variables. They have nothing to do with each other. So I can manipulate the energy you expend, and it's not going to change the energy you take in. I can manipulate the energy you take in, how much you eat, and it's not going to affect how much you expend. And here's a good way to look at it. Um, how many of you remember the concept of working up an appetite? OK? It used to be 30, 40 years ago, if somebody told you to exercise, they did it because they wanted you to work up an appetite. They wanted you to get hungry. Like maybe you're not eating enough, so your doctor would say, oh, play a couple sets of tennis, play some golf, go for a hike. As a matter of fact, your best meals you ever had are probably the ones after you've worked up an appetite, where you're the hungriest. You, know, you go hiking for eight hours. What do you think about on the way back? You know, is what are you going to eat? Um, and how much you can eat because you feel like you've earned it. You know, your body gives up energy exercising and it wants to replace. Just like if you're working out and you sweat and you perspire a lot, you get thirsty because your body wants to replete the amount of water that it lost. Um, I mean, another way to look at this is if, let's say, tonight I was having dinner, Grant's, we're all going over to Grant's house for dinner. I have the five finalists from Top Chef are coming over to Grant's house and they're going to be, cook the tastiest 12-course meal you ever had in your life. And there's going to be enormous portions of food. And I want you to come hungry, OK? What would you do? You get this invitation. It says, come to Grant's house, 12 courses, best food, come hungry. What would you do to accomplish that? And I could think of two things. And unless somebody wants to answer for me. OK, I'll do the talking. Um, I'm going to probably skip lunch, maybe eat less during breakfast, skip my snacks. And then I'm going to probably work out. Like I'll go to the gym. Instead of doing 40 minutes on the treadmill, I'll do an hour on the treadmill. And then I might even say, I think I'm going to walk to Grant's house. It's only four miles. You know? So the two things that you would do to make sure you were hungry, eat less and exercise more, are the two things we give as advice to lose weight. And the problem is, our bodies don't want to expend more energy than they take in. And they don't want to actually take in any more energy than they, than they expend. They want to keep everything constant. It's this concept called homeostasis.